I wait for you. My bones are old and I'm patient. I've lived here on the rock for nearly 400 years. Time ticks slowly by here. Underneath me, caves measure the span in calcified rock. Interminable drip after interminable drip solidifies. The world passes by, a blur of wind and stunted trees swaying. Endless plains of smooth limestone rising up around me like petrified waves. My stones are soaked with lives and deaths, traces and memories. Underneath is the ghost of ancient seas. I wait for you. There are no firm boundaries here. Only a blurred line where my walls end and the ghosts within them begin. The reverberations of lives are knitted into my fabric. A tapestry of blood and bone, voice and movement. I accrete layers of life. My dust, your bones. My groans, your voices. The wind blows over the ridge stone around me, whistling mournfully through the cracks. I inhale. My battered tendons creak, my walls sway. The murmurations of the past breathe out. I wait for you. The Unheimlich Maneuver explores the psychological horror that it occurs when home is subverted as a place of safety, when it becomes surreal, changes and even disappears. In these stories, a coma patient wakes to find herself replaced by a doppelganger. A ghost estate reflects doubles of both houses and inhabitants. A suburban enclave takes control of its trespasses and a beaten woman exacts revenge. Just as the Heimlich Maneuver restores order, health and well-being, the Unheimlich Maneuver does quite the opposite. The Unheimlich Maneuver was written by Tracy Fahey and published by the Sinister Horror Company in 2018. In this episode of Sinister Reread, Justin Park chats with Tracy about one of the publisher's more gothic collections. Hello, this is Justin from the Sinister Horror Company, and I'm here today with author Tracy Fahey. Hello, Tracy. Hi, how are you? I, I'm good, thanks very much. Thanks for uh, coming on my podcast today. How are you? Um, great, thank you. Um, really delighted to be on it. Looking forward to it. Now, Tracy, we're here today to talk about uh, your book, The Unheimlich Maneuver. Uh, it's a short story collection. Uh, described as primarily dealing in sort of uh, what people describe as uh, domestic gothic uh, short stories, which we'll come on to and talk about in a little bit. But just to give a little bit of background and history on the actual collection, the Unheimlich Manoeuvre itself, you have referred to it before as uh, the book that never dies. Uh, and so I'm just kind of curious if you could sort of talk us through and give some of the listeners the kind of the background and the history of the book and its many versions that have appeared. Sure, and in advance, thank you for heralding its resurrection as well, because this book was um, first published in 2016 um, by Boo Books, and uh, it came out in a limited edition, kind of hardcover copy. It was terribly exciting. It was my first book. And then the press folded almost immediately after the book came out. But at the time, I thought, well, I've had an amazing experience. I've met some great people. I've gotten to launch it. It's been rather wonderful. Um, then in 2017, uh, when I ran into you from the Sinister Horror Company, um, we were talking a little bit about it because um, the book had just been nominated for a British Fantasy Award. And you expressed an interest in bringing it out again. So 
to my absolute delight, in 2018, a new version of the Unheimlich Maneuver came out through the Sinister Horror Company. Um, slightly changed around, um, one story omitted, a new story included. And um, yeah, uh, it was a really, really exciting moment. And through the release of that, then the book got a wider readership. And in um, 2020, um, yet again, the Sinister Horror Company decided to bring it out again, this time in an absolutely beautiful um, hardback edition, the deluxe edition, which contained a lot of additional material and really uh, such a, such a handsome book. Um, so yes, this is the book that just won't die. And it's terribly ironic because the whole book is about the uncanny, which is basically boils down to the prevalence of the past and the present. So yeah, um, the name that appears was a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Uh, yeah, an interesting history the book has and uh, I, I was delighted when I was first given a manuscript of it to read. Uh, a very different type of book than um, the horror that I was used to reading, it must be said. So what I want to do is kind of bring you right back to the start because uh, I'm right in saying the Unheimlich Maneuver was your debut uh, collection. So, so what I'd like to do is just talk about um, how did you come to write the, the collection book? Like, why did you write it? Okay, well, as far as origin stories go, um, it's a kind of an unusual one, I guess, because the book itself, most of it was written between 2013 and 2015. And at that time, I was actually writing a PhD um, in the uncanny resurrection of the Gothic home in contemporary Irish art. So as part of that, I was reading about the uncanny, I was thinking about it. And I was also just starting to write creative fiction. But because I was spending pretty much all my spare time hammering away at this gigantic, you know, 100,000 word thesis, um, I got quite obsessed with the notion of the uncanny. So it started to leak into my fiction and it began to completely inform it. So in 2015, actually in the same week, um, I handed up a copy of my thesis and the finished manuscript for the Unheimlich Maneuver because there were so many ideas I had about the uncanny that didn't fit into the strict restraints of my thesis exploration. But they found birth in these works of creative fiction that became eventually the lineup for the Unheimlich Maneuver. So your inspiration for a lot of this kind of originated from from an academic source, would you say? Yeah, I mean, my main source of inspiration. So I read a lot about the Uncanny. Um, Jens Freud, um, Nicholas Roy's great book of two thousand and eleven on the Uncanny. But the one I kept returning to was Freud's essay. And I just became quite obsessed with it because it's a really unusual essay. Freud, obviously, very famous psychoanalyst. So he was interested in this idea of the past and the way it recurs in psychoanalytic terms from his own interaction with patients. But the second half of the essay, he turns completely to almost to literary criticism. And he starts to say, well, you know, in real life, we have these uncanny recurrences, deja vu, strange dreams, buried secrets that come to light. But then he said, actually, it's in creative fiction that we find the fullest expression of these ideas. And um, he maintained that um, really the, the, the creative writer is possibly best placed to kind of push the boundaries of this notion of the uncanny. And I guess I read the essay so many times that it just really seeped into my skull and I began to think, well, I'm exploring this topic in a very academic way, but what if I were to explore this, um, you know, using all these tropes of the uncanny that Freud talks about, everything from dolls to doppelgangers to um, terrible kind of secrets that suddenly come to light. This notion of the familiar becoming a really strange and terrible terrain. 
So would you say, like, as you were yeah, going through the essay, you read it that many times, were you using, like, the, 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 the themes and, and the points in it almost like a checklist with these stories? <laughs> kind of, in that uh, I'm a really, really organised person. Well, I'm kind of very chaotic and very organised. And when it comes to my writing, it's always very thematic. And I love to explore the theme very thoroughly. So in it, I actually looked at all the different ways Freud defines the uncanny. And if you go through the unheimlich manoeuvre, if you're so inclined, you'll be able to check off most of those tropes. Was there any tropes that you didn't get to write about? Yes, castration and blindness. <laughs> there were two key fears that Freud actually identified as part of the uncanny. But I just put that down to Freud's um, obsession, really, with kind of um, this psychoanalytic side. This was something which he found really emerging in his practice. So uh, it didn't really fit into the canon of stories that I was developing. So I'm not a big fan of forcing something when it shouldn't be there. I mean, this book found its own way and the stories found their own voice. Yeah, and I think blindness and castration probably are, they seem a little kind of coarse or something for the, th the rest of the the mood and the texture of, of the stories in the Unheimlich Maneuver. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think blindness is a very interesting concept and that notion of being robbed of a sense. So it's something I might return to in time. But when I was writing it, you know, it wasn't about forcing themes into stories. It was about stories growing organically and me finding a place to put these themes. Okay, and that, that leads me on to the next bit. So, you, so you've got you've got the the, the Freud essay and, and and almost like this kind of sort of checklist of these are the sort of the themes that I want to explore. So that gives you like almost like a bit of a a, a, a mood board of what they were going to sort of look like. So where did you actually then get the inspiration and the ideas for the actual stories on on you know what was actually going to happen in them? Um, whoa, that's a very big question. <laughs> <laughs> that's like, where do you get your ideas from? Absolutely. I don't know. <laughs> a strange, magical place in the back of my imagination, you know. But look, you're a writer too, Justin. You know that the inspiration kind of comes from very random places. And um, I guess um, the very first story that I wrote and the very first story that I had published was uh, looking at Wild Goose Lodge. And if I had to, I suppose, pinpoint kind of a story where I saw the potential for the collection springing from, it would probably be there. Because again, in my academic life, I was running a three-year memory project that was based around the actual true story of the murders at Wild Goose Lodge, which is a 200-year-old atrocity story. But I was kind of interested in exploring this in a fictive way. But as I wrote it, I realized that the story was growing to become something more. It's actually a whole hymn of loss, kind of, about my grandmother and the wonderful story she told. So um, I guess that, that really set the tone for the type of thing I was trying to do, that I was trying to examine the past. I was looking at the past in the present because that story actually starts off when the protagonist is standing on the stones, on the ruins of Wild Goose Lodge itself. And that becomes the launch pad for the story. It becomes about the past returning, which is not just the ancient past that's been recalled in a story, but it becomes about the storyteller of the story as well. So it's a tiny, tiny little story. I think it's one of the shortest ones I've ever written. But I guess that's where the germ of the ideas kind of stemmed from. The idea of exploring kind of multiple points of view in the past, but always bringing it back to the present and looking at how time itself is cyclical and how events, when they happen, just keep coming back into the present and it keep having this impact. That's interesting. See, you talk, it's something you said, I just want to sort of go back to, um, where you talked about the fact that 
you said that you uh, started writing the story and then the story kind of started to inform itself, started to grow into this different kind of beast than what you had initially set off with. Is that, um, is that something that happens a lot in, in your work when you're writing your stories? Do, they, do, do the stories kind of take on a world of themselves and they change as you're writing them? Or do you have like fixed ideas and they generally stick with them? Um, both. <laughs> Every single story is different. Every story is a different gestation. Uh, I mean, that story, Looking for Wild Goose Lodge, I wrote that in two hours. And I know it was precisely two hours because I wrote the first half of it on a flight from Dublin to London and the second half on the return flight. <laughs> <laughs> so that's probably the kind of quickest story I ever wrote. And I wrote it very instinctively and didn't even edit it that much once it was written. Um, I don't write drafts. Um, I will jot down a sentence maybe, what if, blah, 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 you know. Um, and then I'll just have maybe a couple of images that are coming through very strongly. Like in the Heimlich Maneuver, the story sealed. I had this really, really vivid image of a girl sitting kind of flat, kind of in a hallway with checkered tiles and she was crying. And that's kind of really how the story opens. But the whole story became an effort to explain why she was there. It was so vivid, I couldn't get it out of my head. I had to write it out. And in writing it out, I found what I was trying to say, which ended up, of course, um, in, in that strange process of um, kind of spooling out. It became a retelling of the old Irish migratory legend, the seal woman in her skin, but quite heavily disguised. So, and you talked there about, uh, so with Sealed, you had this image that was like, that, that was in your, in your head. And then, so you kind of had to write it out. So, and we talked, like, we began this asking about, like, where do your stories and your inspiration come from? So do they just kind of just appear in your head at sort of random moments? And how do you capture them and make sure you, you don't lose them? Do you write them down in a book or do they just kind of sit in your head until you write them out? Oh God, nothing sits in my head properly. So yeah, I have to, <laughs> have to write it down. Um, I remember reading a nonfiction piece by Roald Dahl where he said, always carry a pen. And he talks about, you know, suddenly being, being struck by these moments of inspiration. If you don't get it down, you're doomed. And he talks about kind of scrawling um, kind of phrases on, I think it was in a car bonnet with lipstick once. And that. And those couple of lines went on to become of Mr. Fox, you know. So I'm a great believer in write it down. Now, this is the whole thing. I'm very organized and very chaotic. So as I'm sitting here talking to you, I'm looking at my desk and I have one, two, three, four notebooks on the go at the moment. So it's basically whatever's to hand. I'll pick it up and I'll scribble it down. But well, my whole life then becomes a quest to find a notebook. You know, Which notebook I, did you put it in, right? I had this great idea. I got some like nice little beats down and yeah, which one? <laughs> or, you know, did I write it on a napkin? <laughs> did I write it on a piece of paper? Is it in my handbag? You know, but someday I aspire to becoming incredibly organized and always carrying <laughs> the same notebook everywhere. But you just never know. I mean, the story Something Nasty in the Woodshed started off with an image as well. It was um, a bloody handprint on a window. So that image was in my head and didn't really do anything with it. And then I was reading about the Joseph Fritzl case because I was giving a lecture actually on the uncanny home. And I was really struck by this idea of kind of the underground um, chamber there and you know the dreadful story of how he'd held his own daughter prisoner but i was really interested in the vilification that elizabeth fritzel his wife was getting in the press because people were saying she must have known she must have known and i thought well what if she didn't but what if she did and yeah and then the story and the bloody handprint suddenly made sense and they twined together 
not very scientific explanation of, of how the process works. But there you go, it can really come from anywhere. Um, that thing I did came from a, a newspaper, a tiny, tiny little newspaper article I saw um, oh, so long ago. And it was just a really tiny, tragic story about a domestic accident. And that one never left my head. I think just because it really terrified me. It was such a small, simple accident with such hideous repercussions. But it wasn't until 20 odd years later that I suddenly thought, oh, actually, that could be a story. And then, of course, it became more than that simple domestic accident. It became an exploration of male vulnerability and ideas of mourning and ideas of repression as well. Yeah, I, I, and you've talked about this before about about exploration. So, when you're writing these stories, are you exploring the ideas as you're writing them and seeing where they're going, or um, do you know already where they're going to go before you sit down with the pen and paper or keyboard? And normally I start at the end of the story. So very often I write the last line first. Uh, I'm not very organized, so I'll jot stuff down, usually the final line, because I, I, I kind of want to know where I'm going, but I have no idea how I'm going to end up there. I have my jumping off point, uh, which is usually quite close to the, the end of the narrative. And I tend to play with chronology as well, so it kind of jumps back and forward a little. Yeah. Um, but then sometimes it can totally surprise me. I, wrote, um, I look like you, um, I speak like you, I walk like you. I thought I had that story figured out. And then pretty close to the end, it just took a really dark turn. And I just sat back and went, wow, okay, I'll go there. Now, I want to talk about that story very briefly, actually. Uh, you take me on a little sidetrack there. But that story itself, um, <clears throat> now I'm right, it's, it's that the story that um, you sold the movie rights to? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's been optioned as a screenplay. So um, um, I'm actually uh, working on it at the moment. In fact, I just got the um, beat sheets for the, for the proposed screenplay. So that's pretty damn exciting. But, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's kind of weird to me. It's, the Enhanced Maneuver has a life of its own, but that story is a life of its own because I could not sell that story, Justin, not for love or money. Uh, people wouldn't touch you with a barge pole. <laughs> I think it's probably the most rejected of all my stories, probably because it is pretty dark. You know, I read dark fiction anyway, but that was super dark. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, and so that was it when it was first on Life Zone. But since the book came out, and I think particularly since the uh, deluxe edition started to uh, get some reviews in, I think am I right in saying that that was a story that a lot of people picked up to say was one of their favourites? Yeah, um, I'm really indebted to Ross Jeffrey from um, Storgy because uh, he was the one who really kind of pinpointed that story. And um, it was the, the twist of it that he really loved. But it was that very twist that had put kind of, I guess, um, caught the editors off it. Um, because it's the, it's the moment when the protagonist turns. And that's always a difficult trick to pull off because essentially you have to hoodwink your reader. But I think that worked really well because I got hoodwinked too. I was suckered in. And then the story took a twist. So, um, yeah, I, I think, but I think as well because that story is about domestic violence, um, and unfortunately, at the moment during COVID nineteen and the accompanying lockdowns, that's become a really, a really, really important topic to talk about, which is this idea of you know, home as a refuge, but what if you're locked down? Um, with somebody who's not very pleasant, you know. Um, it, it really is the most kind of poignant example of the unheimlich home or the uncanny home, when your home turns from being a place of safety to a place of deep discomfort 
um, to a place of disturbance and potentially even death. Yeah, so um, I've talked about your inspirations uh, and where they come from and the, the chaotic nature within which they, they are born uh, as it transpires. So uh, we're thinking about the um, stories from the Unheimlich Maneuver itself. What would you say were your biggest influences from the book? You've already mentioned, obviously, the Freud essay, but was there anything else from, from in like style and content, like potentially other other writers or films or art or music or, or anything else that was you would say would be a direct influence on the stories in that book and how? Well, I remember an early review of the stories published before the Unheimlich Maneuver came out. Uh, which complemented it as a very old-fashioned story. And I thought, oh wow, I guess I am an old-fashioned writer. And at that stage, when I published The Autonomous Maneuver, I was reading almost no contemporary horror. Um, I was, you know, my, my biggest influences, like right from my childhood, were the Bronte, um, particularly um, Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, uh, which is a magnificent Gothic novel really influenced by um, Edgar Allan Poe, um, the lovely, luscious, dangerous prose of Angela Carter, and of course, the absolutely peerless Shirley Jackson. So um, I think the Unheimlich Maneuver has a slightly kind of, um, yeah, the time is out of joint feel about it because at the time, of writing, all of my influences were coming from a much older tradition. So that's about your, your writing. Uh, was there anything else from a story craft point of view or, or mood? Any kind of any, any music or any films or art? Because I know you have a, a big interest in art. We, we work in an art college. So did that have any influence at all as well? Yeah, because I guess at the at the time, and again, it's it's that thing of kind of writing incredibly intensely for a two year period on both kind of fiction and and non fiction. Uh, I, I was just looking at endless images of the kind of reinvention of the Gothic home in the present. So I'm really really obsessed with work, especially by A. Barry, who's a very seminal Irish Gothic artist and uh, I've, I was actually lucky enough to work with with Aideen and we had a lot of conversations about the Gothic and her pieces which are kind of performance pieces, video pieces for the most part just had a very powerful effect on my imagination because um, she puts herself into our work all the time. So um, she's often the protagonist in these really strange, bizarre videos where she's um, trapped in, in a home where she's morphing into these strange creatures like half woman, half hoover hybrids. And yeah, she was a huge influence on the way that I began to think about the Gothic home and how it could be interpreted. And you mentioned there, so you said like the two year period. So was it two years that it took you to write the stories within the Unheimlich Maneuver? Yeah, most of them are written kind of in that period. Now, the very earliest story that I ever wrote was in 2007, and that became Walking the Borderlines, but very different version. And I was just playing around. I didn't start writing really until 2013. Um, so, uh, and talk me through that. I mean, you were uh, you you, you talked you, you mentioned already about uh, your love of reading, and you, you're very widely read. I know personally, you're very widely read, and you've read more books than I think I ever will in my life. <laughs> um, but very and a very wide, broad topic of it. So, I, I guess so. Two thousand and seven, what you you just sort of played around to sort of do writing, but until two thousand and thirteen, you thought, right, I'm going to have a real go at this. How did that come about? Um, well, if you read the first story in the Unheimlich Maneuver, you'll have a pretty fair happens. Um, I was really, really ill. Um, 
fell ill in December 2010 and spent most of 2011 really recovering from that. Um, I'd been in a coma, I'd come out, but I'd been diagnosed with a chronic illness. So I literally had to relearn my body. I had to, um, things that were so simple and instinctive, like eating, and sleeping and um, exercising, all became, um, I suppose, things that had to be relearned. A lot of people talk about this. It'd been through some kind of traumatic body change. You know, it, it's that process of having to rediscover again. But I'd always had a really kind of active life, you know, um, and that all got suspended for a year. So it was a time of introspection. Uh, I realized that I could have died. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I know this is trying to sound very morbid, but all of a sudden I just thought, well, you know, wow, what do I really want to do? So um, I guess in my head, I was starting to compose a bit of a bucket list. I'd always wanted to write, but I'd always had the idea that, oh, there was lots of time to, you know, do that when I was finished doing whatever else I was doing at the time. But that was a pivotal moment because I realised I don't have all the time in the world. I have no idea how much time I have. So it be began to be about what have I wanted to do. And I guess that's why I started the fiction writing, the academic writing um, in 2010. 10, I actually started up an art collective in Limerick where I was living uh, and we started doing big kind of public kind of participative projects that were about reimagining sites and histories. So yeah, I think I just kind of went wild creatively for a while, but it was writing that just was such an enriching and almost therapeutic kind of way to explore ideas and thoughts and feelings. So yeah I mean you talked about the fact that then you kind of just kind of went out and did a whole load of things and you 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 mentioned this already but at the same time as is doing uh as writing the stories on the Unheimlich maneuver you were writing an academic paper at the same time um so and you said, you know, oh, you might not have that much time left. I mean, you weren't giving yourself much time at all. How did you fit it all in? Uh, <laughs> you know, I have no idea, but it is amazing the amount of time you have when you're kind of confined to home. As I was for about a year, I was, I was really just working and being at home because I was completely exhausted. But I'm a really bad person, so I refused to take time out. You know, I just kind of kept soldiering on. But... As it turned out, I had kind of quite a bit of time on my hands and I started practices then, which I think still serve me in good stead. So like at the at the moment, I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm on the screenplay. I'm messing about a short story. I'm writing an abstract for an academic book on death cafes. So I always have a couple of projects on the go. I don't like to have a very unitary channel for my creative responses. I like to, always like to go in slightly different directions. You talked about the fact already, we talked about your writing and, and how you, your writing process, sometimes you'll start at the end and kind of work backwards or you'll come up with an image. Um, and you talked about the fact you, you don't really write in drafts. So I was just kind of wondering how that bit works. Like when you've written a story, is there much in a way of revision you do after you've got that first bit done and how does that revision sort of manifest itself? To be honest with a lot of the stories, I write them and then they're written. <laughs> uh, I don't write, sometimes I write really fast and sometimes I write the story in a seamless way, like the woman next door. That story was written in one continuous surge over about a two or three day period where I could just pick it up and go, yep, yeah, that's where I am in the chronology, keep on writing. Um, with, with, but that, that story is a bit unusual in that um, it, it tends to start at one point and finish at another point. With the other stories, um, probably because they have this kind of shifting temporality, you know, um, 
they're a little choppier and they tend to go back and forward in time. So I'll often write it and then just move chunks around. But at a certain point I'll go, yes, I got it. And at that point then I'll just pretty much write to the end. Okay, so, so some of it seems quite, uh, quite fluid in your writing. Was there any stories in the Unheimlich Maneuver, and I'm thinking expanding it all the way to the deluxe edition, so for all those stories to choose from, was there any stories in there that weren't so fluid that perhaps took a, a little longer to tame and get right? I think actually one of the newer stories, um, I Wait For You, that story kind of tortured me. <laughs> Uh, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. You know, I had this idea where the where the house becomes narrator, and I was super excited by that. I, mean, I knew exactly where I wanted to situate it, which in the the burren in County Clare, which is an amazing place with kind of um, which used to be the bottom of a seabed, and I was reading lots about stone tape theory and the idea of limestone holding resonance more than any other stone, and I was like, oh. Yes, yes, so it's this house that's waiting and somebody comes along and, you know, um, the whole story starts. I could not start that story, Justin. In fact, I think you probably remember it because I wrote it for the deluxe edition and I was kind of dilly-dallying on delivering that one because I first started writing it in um, first-person plural. It's like, oh, we wait for you. What an amazing idea to have a house talking with multiple voices. Yeah, when I tried to write it, it was literally impossible. <laughs> I could not <laughs> get, I could not get the rhythms to flow. It felt artificial to be saying we and us all the time. Um, and I lost connection with it completely. And I just threw it aside. And then about a week later, I thought, what if I write in first person singular? as if the house is an entity rather than a collection of disparate voices. And yeah, wrote, rewrote the first couple of paragraphs and went, now it's, now it's starting to sing. And then it went on, but you know, I guess those kind of hiccups are entirely normal. When you're just trying out something, it might not work. Um, but if the idea is good, and I knew the idea was a good one because it resonated with me, it made me feel excited. So it was just a matter of, I guess, trying to dig down and find the way to tell it. And you mentioned there talking about your narrative form. Now, I, I kind of sort of made it no secret about the fact that actually the Unheimlich Maneuver was a, a very inspirational book uh, for me. You know, when I read it, it was like something I kind of hadn't really read before. Um, and one thing I can say, where if I can pinpoint like particular areas, there's one area is particular area in narrative style and I believe it's ghost estate phase two where you write in second person narrative is that right um yeah that was actually I think the second story I ever had published and I was just experimenting um and tell me about that tense because I say I read it and after reading that tense is I've used that tense a couple of times directly after reading that story and in the, the the way that it kind of worked and the, the emotion it sort of gave off. So can you tell me about like, you know, why you chose to write in that style and that story and what, what, what you think it does? It was just the, the mode that suited the story because I wanted something that would draw the reader in. So by continually addressing the reader, you, you, it's yours, um, it does actually suck you in. But as well as that, I wanted a sense of displacement because I normally write in um, first person singular. So in this, the protagonist has kind of come adrift from herself. Um, she starts off by feeling that um, her old life has stalled and she's trapped in this ghost estate and this never time, she calls it. And I wanted that sense where she's almost imagining that, that out there, there's another version of her that's wandering around, that's, you know, living the life she was meant to lead. So I just, 
I just wanted to get that idea of displacement across, I guess. Um, and I had a particular reason for doing it, which becomes obvious at the very end of the story. Um, but I don't know if I'm allowed, you know, spoil oh, things here. <laughs> you are more, more than welcome to here. I mean, when we do uh, the Sinister reread shows, I, I, I'm happy to talk about spoilers. Um, because if you want to get in depth in stuff, sometimes you don't want to tiptoe around things. So I kind of explain that, you know, there's spoilers ahead in these. So if oh, you phew. want to talk about any endings, <laughs> you want to talk about any endings or anything to do with it, just go right on in. Don't worry. Okay. Well, at the, at the very end of it, our protagonist is in this ghost estate house and there's somebody pounding on the, on the window of the house, which is the uncanny mirror of her of her own house and um when she um when she goes to the window it's herself there screaming let me in so it's that profound moment where everything just drops when your heart drops through your stomach when you realize that everything around you has dissolved um and that your worst fear has become realized you've become separated from yourself and you're looking at yourself terrified and wanting to get into you Is it, i actually stole the idea from a nightmare my sister had when she was a kid <laughs> <laughs> really? yeah it still terrifies her when she thinks about it but she told me the story of her dream so vividly that you know like umpteen years later it just stayed with me and i thought oh i am totally gonna steal that one so yeah moral of the story never be friends with a writer never be their sibling they will steal <laughs> your experience and transmute it into a story that, that, that's interesting i was going to ask another question but i really want to touch on this just very quickly so you know you so that inspiration came from uh, uh a dream that your sister had and told you when when you were both younger okay yeah. so uh, when you think about like uh these kind of things when, when you're drawing inspiration from from your life and kind of collecting these bits around from other people are you not worried that you're going to run out of ideas at any point no i mean the world well you know um it's been said that there's only seven stories you know <laughs> so and uh, what we produce are infinite and multiple variations on those so um i think i read a lot i listen a lot i think a lot and um, so the the world around us as it unfolds, the conversations we overhear, the interactions we have, all of those are seeded with possibility. So inspiration is kind of never ending really because life goes on, the media generates stories, you know, um, we, we just live in a world of constantly unfolding narratives. So I think it's impossible not to feel inspired by that. Good, that's an inspiring answer. I, I, I like that. So, so where, where I was going to go with this, and it kind of sort of leads on to it, is um, talk about the fact uh, that uh, your stories kind of, they have this emotional kind of impact. And I find them very sort of empathic. Uh, maybe that's the, the, the style you write or the, the way that you use the narration within it. Um, and I was going to sort of ask, I mean, how much do you draw on your own personal experiences when writing? And when you're using other people's experiences, such like, a dream that your sister had when she was a child. How do you br bring all that kind of empathic emotional response into someone else's experiences? That's a really, really good question. So, and I've got quite a long answer for it, I think. Yeah, yeah you'll go for it. Um, because I'm kind of thinking through as, as you were speaking. So, yeah, I, I guess first of all, I've never made any secret about the fact that like, my writing tends to be quite autoethnographic. So a lot of what I write stems the life that I've led, the Irish Catholic culture that I've grown up in, um, the kind of folklore that I would have heard since I was a child. Uh, even geographically, I feel that my stories are quite culturally Irish. So, um, and I can't help it really. That's, that's, that's where I come from. But, you know, sometimes a story will demand a different location, a different setting, a different type of, of narrator. And I just go with that. 
um, I think that when we try to write empathically, um, it, it really helps be able to put yourself into somebody's shoes. And there was a many years ago when I was at university studying history of art degree, uh, we did a seminar on the Baroque and my professor at the time, Professor Alistair Rowan, who was a bit of a, a bit of a genius, came up with this idea of really getting us to situate ourselves in the Baroque era, which is a period that was dominated by hyper-realistic kind of Catholic imagery of martyrdoms, etc. Um, and it was a very deliberate propaganda kind of piece by the church to try and um, draw people in, to give them an emotional stimulus to piety through these horrific scenes, that they would identify, that they would feel this pain. And at the same time, um, uh, St. Ignatius Loyola created a set of spiritual exercises. And I remember thinking at the time, this is really amazing because it was this idea that, oh, you know, um, it's, it's about trying to be present and trying to reimagine these kind of biblical scenes. So you picture the crucifixion, you picture the sounds, the smells, what you'd hear, you know. Um, and again, there were a set of spiritual exercises that, were, that had a kind of a, uh, a meditative aspect to them that would allow you to drop into this position of deep contemplation of another time, another place, other characters. So I think I've always hung on to a bit of that. But also in terms of, of empathy, um, uh, I suffer from a generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, and I think it's that anxiety that it informs a lot of my writing. I don't think that's necessarily a very healthy thing, but it does explain why I tend to write horror rather than, you know, comic fiction. Um, because, and because of that anxiety, I have extra empathy with characters who are anxious, who are, who, who feel quite tortured, who feel indecisive, who feel trapped, um, who feel threatened. So, when I'm writing a story, I am that character. There's no other way to put it. Um, I have to step through the beats of the story in their shoes, no matter how painful or how tight those shoes are. Um, and it's it's through that experience that kind of those kind of spiritual exercises of putting myself in that character, that seat, that will allow me to see the world as they would see it. That's got to be exhausting. It's really exhausting, but weirdly, um, you see, the act, the act of writing for me is very exhilarating because once I hit the flow, once I hit that magical space and time, things are flowing, there is no anxiety. And that is one of the most seductive aspects of writing for me. Find that, that flow state. Yeah, it's like it's kind of like chasing a high when you're writing, trying to get to that state. And does that come often when you're writing? Um, I, I try not to publish anything where I haven't felt that because to me, achieving that state, it's kind of like alchemy. It's when words become more than words, when ideas are kind of blossoming and possibly in your head, when your pen is trying to keep up with the, the ideas that spill forth when the different strands of the story are just starting to weave together. It really is, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. It's precisely why I write. I want to go back to uh, talk about um, your, talk about some of the styles and tricks of your writing. Now, the, the thing I found with the stories, you know, in Heimlich Maneuver, which I absolutely loved, was the way that your stories have like a, like a kind of a, a way of lingering long after you've sort of finished reading the story, you put the book down and the story's still in your head and that feeling and that, that creeping dread that all the way through the story is still kind of there. And it's, it, to me, it's a really intriguing and wonderful trick, yet you do it time and time again through the stories as I'm reading them. So I wonder like, uh, without kind of giving away your secret formula, 
Um, I mean, how, how do you do this? How do you go about it? And where did you learn this from? <laughs> okay, I've got a really simple answer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> After the long, lovely answer from the last one. <laughs> no, I mean, like, you, you have said that to me before, and I thank you for it, because that's exactly what I want to do. I want to, I want to creep you all out, you know? I want to leave you with this sense of unease. But I think it's, when I write, I don't think about the audience at all. Um, I think about, writing for me is like trying to listen for a voice that's very faint. And once you hear that voice louder and louder, as you kind of almost write through the undergrowth to get to it. Um, if I feel I'm fully present in the story, writing the story, I'm afraid, I'm scared. Um, I'm disturbed in the way they're disturbed. Um, yeah, I, but I don't know how, I can't explain it. This is why I'd be a terrible creative writing teacher because um, I, never, I never learned to write fiction. Um, I have absolutely no formal training in it. Everything I learned about how to write was from reading. So you, you learned from osmosis, basically. Do you go back when you read something or when you read something in the past, did you go back, reread things to, to learn how those things have been done to understand that? Or is it just something that you just go away and kind of emulate from the first impression? I think just unconsciously, uh, whenever I read anything, I was dissecting it. Um, I've. I've often quoted, and James Everington quotes this one too, it's the Stephen King line, that everything you read, you read with a grinding envy or a weary contempt. Yes, correct. So, you know, I would read stuff and I'd go, no, not my kind of thing. Or I'd read something, I mean, like The Haunting of Hill House by Shirley Jackson, I would read that pretty much every year because I'm always trying to unpeel the alchemy of how she does it. And the only way to do that is to keep reading, you know. Um, I love Donna Tartt's A Secret History. That, that, that one haunts me. And, and whenever I read it, I'm reading it in one sense because I enjoy the narrative voice. I love the prose. I love the ideas. The other hand, I'm going, ah, okay, she did this. That's such a clever idea. I know. Um, this is not a very scientific answer. Um, I didn't start writing until 2013, but in my head I was always going to be a writer. So I read books as if I was going to be a writer. I just wasn't writing. But you, you, you brought me on to something, um, which, which I, I've kind of, I think recently myself, uh, I've just kind of discovered is um, the joys of uh, the repeat experience. So rereading a book or rewatching a film. I mean, do, do you find when you do that, do you get a lot more out of it those second, third, fourth times around? You know, what are you getting from those repeat experiences? Depends. I think writing resonates with you at different times. Um, we mentioned Stephen King. I, I remember when I was a young teenager reading Night Shift, his first collection, and going, oh my God, these stories are amazing, you know, because it was my first experience really with contemporary horror. And this whole idea that, you know, you could set stuff in the present day, you know, with identifiable situations just blew my mind. Reading back over it then years later, it didn't hold up as well as I wanted it to. But there was one story, Strawberry Spring, which I read and I thought, oh my God, this is an absolutely beautiful story. And it's a story I feel in which Stephen King really finds his voice, as it were, because it's utterly haunting. Every, every time I, I reread, I find something new. Uh, it's partly because I read a lot all the time. I've got about five or six books on the go. So my memory isn't always the best. So I can sometimes reread something and be absolutely surprised by it, you know? Um, things or characters or settings will suddenly jump out to me. But it's part of life. Because we, exper we experience things at different stages. So whether it's a theme, whether it's a location, you know, it'll have extra resonance to you as you accrue life experience. Okay, so we've, we've talked uh, very early on about 
the themes uh, in, in the book and you touched on uh, the themes of, of the uncanny, uh, particularly with the Freud essay. Um, is there any other additional kind of themes or messages um, within the Unheimlich Maneuver that you're exploring? Would you want to go further into what we were talking about at the beginning? Um, I feel like I should say, draw up a chair here, because I'm <laughs> going to talk, talk forever about the themes. Uh, the Unheimlich Maneuver, I think, will probably always be my favourite collection, because it comes from a very deep obsession about home. Um, it's a very, so for a start, the collection is a very interior collection in every way. So uh, not only has, does it have as its setting the idea of home, but it's, it's also, I suppose, a lot of the protagonists in it lead lives of quiet desperation, you know. Um, home for them is not a sunny, warm place. It's a place where they're, where they're trapped. It's a, it's a place where they feel great discomfort. It's um, maybe a place of transition. Um, it's, it's a place where they're, where they're ill. It's a place where they're afraid. And I was kind of tapping into it. It wasn't just Freud's essay, but I was interested in cross applying it to the way that we regard home in Ireland. Um, because as, you know, um, as a former colonized country, Irish people have a very interesting relationship and quite dysfunctional relationship with home. Because there were so many centuries of dispossession and there wasn't kind of fixity of tenure, so you could be evicted from your home at a moment's notice. So the whole hold and home became very precarious. And, um, possessing a home was so important. I mean, in the short story Possession, which is in the deluxe edition of the Unheimlich Maneuver, um, I talk about this, this whole idea. Um, and I think I, I say something like, um, we think that houses possess us, in fact, or sorry, we, we think that we possess houses, in fact, the reverse is true. And I think in Ireland, it became a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy because uh, as soon as Ireland hit the economic boom of the, you know, like 2000, 2008, the first thing people did was buy houses and the property market imploded and people were, you know, developing massive estates and um, like, it was crazy, you know, people were investing, they were buying like 15 houses, you know, and it was part of it was this land anxiety and this greed for home, which kind of stems from this very tortured relationship with kind of notions of belonging, possessing and having a home. Also, um, in Irish fiction, there's also this, this idea of the home as a very secret kind of almost dangerous place. And that stems from our earliest kind of folk stories, which are all about guarding the home against invaders, principally the, uh, the she or the, or the Irish fairies. So home's always been seen as a place that's permeable, a place that can be attacked, a place that isn't necessarily safe. And folklore has this way of passing down coded messages about what we value, what we're afraid of. Um, so I guess kind of in, within this notion of Irishness, there's all of these complex feelings when we look at home, when we think about home, and it's problematized by all of these. So it was really, really great to kind of be able to explore a lot of these ideas through fiction. So we talked about kind of like the book and the kind of uh, the insides of the book. So let's talk about a little bit about the book, about the package of it, uh, just for a second. And uh, just before I go into this, um, we're, we're just going to talk about the cover. Uh, normally I would turn around and sort of say to people at this point sort of, how did the cover come about? And just before we go into that, I just want to put my hand up and say, it's a bit weird me asking this one because I actually made the cover for this one, which is unusual in the Sinister Horror Company, uh, but I did. Um, so it's weird that I'm going to ask questions I clearly know the answers to. 
um, but I'm going to ask them anyway. Because what I like to do at this point is to talk about the kind of... Uh, so with Sinister Horror Company, one of the things I'm kind of proud of is the fact that there is a collaborative nature between the publisher and, and the author. So this is kind of one of the things I always like to talk about within this. So when we talk about like, like the cover of the Unheimlich Maneuver, the, 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 the new version of it, um, I just want to ask you, your thoughts on like, how did the cover come about and what kind of input did you have into it? Um, well, first of all, I'm glad you did the disclaimer because I was kind of thinking, how am I going to talk about it as if you don't know? <laughs> but, <laughs> but no, I mean, like this, this, if you like, is the small press experience. And it's just been such a positive experience for me is that ability to become involved in every aspect of the, of the book. And I think because you and I had spent so much time talking about it, and you really got the Unheimlich Maneuver. You really knew what I was trying to achieve. So um, when we talked about it, we were talking about the Uncanny, and I mentioned that it was green. And <laughs> because I tend to see things quite visually. And um, I think you actually kind of took that fact away in your lizard brain, which doesn't really forget facts like that. Um, and we also just talked about it being quite a simple notion, the idea of the, of the uncanny home being this fractured or disrupted kind of home. Um, and then you came up with that idea of the kind of simple shape with the crack running down it. And I love it because I'm a big fan of a simple image that's very telling. And for me, that crack becomes not just this kind of dangerous idea. Um, I actually wrote a paper once on ghost states, which was called Cracks in the Foundations, you know. Um, so I love that idea of a fissure that can be both real and imagined, but also that crack down the middle becomes an aperture. It becomes your way into this dark house and a way to explore it. Uh, but it's such, I'm actually looking at the cover right now and thinking, oh my God, I love this so much. I also love the use of the typewriter font because um, I learned to type a really old typewriter belonging to my mother. And I would peck away at the keys for, for hours, you know, fancying myself a writer as a, as a child. So for me, that, that kind of typeface has a real resonance. I love it. Um, yeah, so, and oh, and, and then for the deluxe edition, and um, Justin, you actually went one further because I mentioned the story of Wild Goose Lodge as being hugely important to me. Um, really, you know the way sometimes you feel there's one story you could tell for the rest of your life in different ways? For me, Wild Goose Lodge is that. Uh, it's a story that's part of my cultural heritage. It's part of my family. It's part of the locality I grew up in. And this whole ability to imagine horrors in the everyday stems a lot from, you know, hearing that and other folk tales as bedtime stories. So when it came to the cover of the deluxe edition, um, you actually played around with a print that I'd made of the, um, the, the ash tree, which stands at the site of, of Wild Goose Lodge. And you have to squint a bit, so um, if, you're, if you're listening and you have a copy of the deluxe edition, pick it up and, you know, really examine the back cover and you'll see that ghostly shadow of the ash tree coming out. And I love that because, again, it's that very notion of the uncanny. It's the reality of the past and the present, this feeling of dreadful recurrence, um, this, this feeling of buried secrets. So... Yeah, I think it's fair to say, Justin, I love this cover and I think it's one of the finest piece of works you've kind of ever done as a, as a designer. Thank you very much. £20 is in the post. <laughs> or, or 20 euro. 20 euro. I don't, know, I don't know. What's the exchange rate? I'll go for the higher. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so that, that, that's the, then the package and then the outside of it. So... Um, Another thing that I kind of like to, to ask that we haven't got around into talking about at the moment is uh, uh, the environment. So the outside of you when you're writing, 
Um, some people, when they, when they write, um, they put music on, listen to music. Other people want silence. Some people put the TV on. Some people have a particular room they write in, or some people like to only write in coffee shops. So it's always so varied on what is the, the way that people write. So in thinking about the, when you're writing the stories for the Unheimlich movie, what was your environment? How did you create that? And what was going on around you whilst you were writing those stories? Three different locations, really. One is kind of planes, trains and automobiles, because I've, well, up to this year, I've always traveled a lot. And, I've, and I find traveling an amazing way to write because you're kind of suspended from everyday worries. You're in transit, you're in motion, you're neither in one place nor another. I find that curiously restful. So, uh, yeah, so a lot of bits got, got, got scribbled on trains and, and planes there. Um, I also wrote in a coffee shop, actually kind of so many stories had so many parts written there that when I, uh, when I had a launch for the Unheimlich Maneuver in, in Limerick, I actually had a launch in that coffee shop. Um, I was completely obsessed with a particular table that had a particular light beside it. It was just far enough away from other tables that I could hear the hum of conversation, but I couldn't hear any distinct voices. And the last place was at home. And really, I was kind of obsessed for, for two years. I pretty much lived in that study, which uh, was a really wonderful room to write in. The part in fact, didn't have a door, so it was always quite cold. And I was forever switching, you know, I'd sit down and I'd write a bit on my thesis. <laughs> I'd stop and I'd write a bit on the story. And, you know, if, if the non-fiction wasn't flowing, maybe the fiction would and vice versa. So, yeah, uh, they were the key locales, I guess. That's interesting. So when you're out about or when you're at home, um, are, are, are you uh, in silence? When I mean by silence, I mean ambient noise because you're in a coffee shop, there's lots of things, same with travelling. So is it just that ambient noise that's around you or do you listen to music whilst you're writing? Um, yeah, but it has to be either um, music with, 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 with no lyrics or lyrics I don't understand. Okay, um, like Seagull Ross maybe or something. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I mean, you can be damn sure when I was writing the Heimlich Maneuver, I was listening to Tack because I have that one pretty much in repeat when I'm writing. Um, what else? There's, a, there's an album by The Thrills, which I, I, it, it's not usually... Thrills, so much for the city. Yeah, I love that album. But <laughs> it was a blast from the past. You could listen to it kind of one summer and I got to that brilliant stage where a piece of music is like a well-worn jumper you know you can put it on and you know it's you just slip into it you don't even notice that you're listening so there's that one um, and is that sorry can I just go back there because cause that one obviously I know the album well it's got it's got lyrics in it but it's because you know it so well that the lyrics don't demand your attention anymore yeah, I almost can't hear them, um, but but I like it because it's really bouncy and upbeat. And sometimes when I'm writing, I'm writing such morose stuff, you know, or I'm starting to feel worried about it. So this isn't going anywhere. So it and actually Django Django's first album, again, another brilliantly bouncy kind of happy album, I find really um, conducive to freeing up the flow. Interesting. So you're writing all that dark stuff that you've got the bouncy stuff going on in the background, keeping your mood up. Uh, it, it depends. When I was writing new music for old rituals, I was listening all the time. I was obsessed with Villager's first album, Becoming a Jacko. And that's really dark and moody and Irish and intense, but it just fitted the mood of it. And then sometimes when I'm flying through writing, when I'm in the flow, as it were, when I'm in the driving seat, uh, I don't even notice. Is there music? Is there silence? You know, the outside world ceases to exist. One of the things I like to uh, sort of ask as well, because sometimes this gets sort of overlooked from from people, um, because you know people reading it might not necessarily know or might not pick up on it. Um, but when people are writing stories, sometimes they uh, 
have uh, specific, specific significance for naming characters or places, particular things or setting things in particular locations. Um, I mean, you've already talked about the, the sense of like location uh, and particularly, you know, in Ireland being something that's very important to you. So I just wondered if there's anything you've not touched on or, or, already of in the Unheimlich maneuver, were there any names of characters or places which did have significance and, and why? A lot of them were kind of anonymous locations and sometimes I struggle to remember my characters' names, I'll be honest, because I never name characters after anyone I know. Uh, I find that really distracting because the character has to be completely conceived of by me. They can't have any, you know, kind of real life counterparts, as it were. Uh, so I usually give them really forgettable names. <laughs> so sometimes when I read a review and they're going, oh, um, so-and-so does this in the story, I think, oh, was that her name? Because I'm writing in the first person singular, so I'm thinking all the time, I, 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 you know. So occasionally I even forget the names. But locations, okay, there are some key ones. Wild Goose Lodge, I've, 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 I've mentioned kind of yep. umpteen times, it keeps recurring, you see. Um, but uh, I mentioned that I Wait For You is quite clearly set in the Burren. Um, the ghost estate phase two is actually set in a real life ghost estate that I visited and photographed somewhat illegally back in 2013. Uh, I broke into a deserted ghost estate and just took photo after photo after photo because it was just the weirdest, strangest place I'd ever been in where you've got this utterly normal estate and then you look at it again and you realise the weeds are six feet tall, you know. The buildings are all perfect, but they're all missing, you know, a door. Um, it's just, yeah, so that that one, I actually went to visit it for uh, an article that I was writing on uh, neoliberal Gothic, and then it ended up being a short story. And Tracing the Spectre was actually set and partially written in the famously haunted uh, Charleville Forest, which is an amazing castle in Ireland. I uh, spent 24 hours there doing an art project and out of it that story was born because again it was just a crazy atmospheric setting. I tend to write location notes um, so I have even more notebooks just even more notebooks that are scattered <laughs> around that, that have descriptions of settings from all the places in the world that I've visited and they just kind of lie dormant because I really thrive on going somewhere and just noticing all those tiny divergent details that mark the place as being other from that which I've previously experienced. And I think I started doing that in my late teens and it's, uh, it's, it's become a habit, which is actually really handy because sometimes when I want to set a story in another location, in another setting, I'll actually look at those notes. Uh, something I picked up whilst you were talking about that there was, so you're writing notes about locations in places, which are, seems to be the most important thing to you. And that is clearly so in the Unheimlich maneuver. But when it comes to the characters, the characters are people that uh, you say they have to come completely from you, yes. which, is, which, is, which is very interesting. It's quite hard to explain. They're very real to me, like very real. I mean, even in the um, in the tiny little story that I wrote, um, which is in the on Hamlet Maneuver in the 2020 edition, um, Haunted by the Ghost, like that story is what, like a page and a bit long. But in my head, that's a really big story. I knew who those characters were. I knew their backstory. I knew why they'd kind of gone on the holiday in the first place. Like um, I knew, you know, kind of how far in the into the the the, the timeline the protagonist returns to that space. So that story was bigger in my head, but then when it came out on paper, it was extremely pared down. So the characters have to feel real to me. They have to feel believable. They have to feel fleshed out. And it's because I step through the story in their shoes. 
um, they they all have a reality to me, um, and I don't. I feel very uncomfortable writing a story if I can't picture or feel or sense the protagonist. And and just to sort of go on that, so you, so with these characters, and they're so real, you've got all that, that background. Is that background something that you sketch out and note down somewhere, or is it all just kept in your head? Mm, I might write a few notes down like uh she's really tortured by x and y in her past you know but as i'm writing like she'll kind of flesh herself out as it were you know uh she'll you know have particular likes or dislikes um she'll be really happy about some things you know it's i, I don't know it's very hard process to describe it's like getting to know somebody is probably the best way that i could frame it writing a story is a process of getting to know your protagonist so i want to take you back to um the time when right back to the initial release of the unheimlich maneuver and we're going to go back to the original one so the one in 2016 was it with boo books yep yeah. so that was it so so it's your debut collection it's coming out it's gonna have your name written all over it um i want to take you back to just before it's coming out and and tell me how, how are you feeling <laughs> i'll be honest i was happy as larry justin like i was delighted you know I'd, yeah like because i'd i kind of thought oh it'd be great to have a book come out but then when uh, boo books did a call out and said oh we're we're looking for for manuscripts and i sent the i sent the three sample stories and a kind of a synopsis which later became the blurb i think um alex wrote back saying oh you know i really like what you've sent um how, how soon can you send the rest and I thought, oh wow, okay, because I had um, my, my PhD wasn't quite written at that point. Also, I didn't dare tell him that I hadn't finished writing the Unheimlich Maneuver. <laughs> so I had to kind of hustle myself into doing it in a very short space of time. Because he said, oh, you know, we are looking at several books at the, at the moment. So I thought, oh God, I better get it in. So I think I was so busy trying to get it in, trying to get the PhD finished, that I didn't think too much about what would happen if it became a book. And then when he accepted it, I was so excited because I just thought, oh, I'll throw it in. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll learn something from the constructive feedback I get. That was my whole point in kind of putting it in. So I didn't, it sounds very naive, but I didn't think anything of it. I mean, Alex said to me, oh, you should go to Edgelit and we can launch it there. And I thought, launch? Oh, fantastic. This just gets better and better. So <laughs> I didn't really have any nerves. I was just really excited by it. And it wasn't until I actually got to the launch, I realized, holy hell, these like real, real people here, really good writers here. And it was only then that I began to feel a trickle of apprehension. Oh my God, maybe people are going to read this. <laughs> that realisation, right? No, I hadn't, I hadn't actually thought of that at all up to that point. Um, I hadn't thought about it being out in the world as a book other people would read and react to. Because I was just thinking of, oh, it'll come out and it'll be cool. It'll be a book. You know, I'll be able to have it on my shelf. It'll be amazing. But yeah. Um, and so, so then it does come out, right? And then people are reading it. So, so what was the reaction? And, and like, you know, how did you take it? Were you re looking at reviews on Amazon every day or, or, or what? You know, tell me about that time. Yeah, I, I, again, I know I sound like the most idiotic person ever. I didn't really think about reviews, you know. I kind of knew that people obviously reviewed stuff, but... The idea that somebody would pick up my book and read it uh, just hadn't really crossed my brain. And then um, Paul Michaels did a lovely one for This Is Horror. And I was just really gobsmacked that somebody had sat down and taken a lot of time with it, clearly, and kind of gotten what I was going for. 
and um, and tempered it with constructive criticism, which was great. And I thought, oh wow, um, this is fantastic. I mean, look, there's a lot of discussion about reviews. I understand reviews are not for writers. Reviews are for readers ultimately. But as a writer, I've learned a lot from reading reviews. And I think part of that is that I've had the privilege to be reviewed by some extremely insightful for critics. Um, I'm thinking of like uh, Kit Power and uh, Andrew Garvey and um, Rowan Fortune, you know, people who really like to offer a bit of a meditation on the, on the book. And that to me is just, you know, it's more rewarding than anything. It's that sense that somebody has engaged and reflected. I mean, you couldn't really ask for anything more. Thank you. So that, that's what that's how you felt when when the book came out. So now the book's out and, and the book is a thing. Um, and what I'm kind of curious about is, is you know, we all know, like is, is, is like I say, a publisher, a reader, etc. We know the book is like its complete product now. But obviously there was a lot of work that has gone in kind of before that. So um, I just kind of thinking about uh, this, the work that went into the book. Was there any things that you took out of the book that you made changes to um, before it got released. And I'm talking about, uh, you know, we've got different editions in there as well. So what, what there were changes between the editions, what changes were they and why? Um, okay, I won't lie. For the, for the first book, um, I kind of jammed all the stories in. I ordered them very, very carefully though. So the first story is, will always be in every edition will be coming back because that's the story of my own writing birth. It's not my favorite story. And I would criticize it for being a little bit unfiltered and a little bit too autoethnographic, but it's a very real story. And it is my superhero origin story. So that'll always be <laughs> first. And Wild Goose Lodge will always be last because it is the closer for it, but it's also the, the, the opener for my second collection, which is Folk Horror. So, um, but apart from that, uh, you know, when, when the first edition came out, there were two stories in particular that got a lot of flack um, for not being horror, which kind of perplexed me because I was like, no, this is like domestic gothic. It's it, like, oh, I didn't want right. to be horror, you know. Uh, one was Pitch Perfect, which I dropped from the subsequent book, but I, I quite like that, that little story. It was set in the smallest uh, room in the world I've ever stayed in, which is a tiny room in Earl's Court in London. <laughs> and again, it was one of those settings that had to make it in. But it is a horror story. It's just that nobody got it because the horror is that this guy is away from home and he's trying to practice this pitch for um, a client who may or may not be coming, but as he's in London, uh, he can just call home. And but every time he calls home, he feels that his partner is slipping further and further away from him. And I love that sense of kind of horror and unease, which the other story explored, which is Two Faced, which has has that idea of I guess the essential unknowability of another. That's what both those stories kind of played with an overwhelming horror. It's that feeling that um, security is not just tied to the bricks and mortar of home, it's the people within it. And what happens when you feel those people slip away? What happens when you feel you can't trust those people anymore? So Two-Face stayed, uh, Pitch Perfect went in the next edition, 2018. But I also added in something nasty in the woodshed which um, I really, um, I really liked as, as a story. It's, it's quite, it's quite bloody for me. It's quite visceral, but uh, I remember showing you, you it at the time and saying, I think this one kind of belongs in, and you read it and you went, yeah, absolutely. So um, I always trust your judgment. I might argue sometimes, but ultimately <laughs> I trust your judgment and you are, such an excellent editor to work with because you really kind of have that sense of when something is working or when something is not working. 
Um, Because I I think I talked to you about maybe leaving Too Faced out of it as well. Yes. Because I've gotten a bit of flack. And you just said no. (laughs) Well, to me, that was kind of one of the major themes of actually the book. And it was really kind of highlighting it. I seem to remember. And I was like, no, no, that that one I want to keep. Um, yeah, you see, this was this this is one of the reasons why I, why I wanted to work with you as a publisher because you got that, and most people who read it just didn't. They were just reading it, going, "What's the horror in two people having a holiday in Vienna and not really getting on very well?" <laughs> well, well, when you put it like that, <laughs> it's essentially what the story is, really. Oh yeah, I also visited in Vienna, so that comes from my location notes in one of my unidentifiable notebooks as well. <laughs> but, but then I suppose when, when we turn to the 2020 edition, I really wanted to do something special for that. And um, you were brilliant. You were completely egging me on, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know, go nuts. So I go, well, I'd really like to write an essay about kind of Freud's notion of the uncanny and the way we can creatively respond to it and the way I've creatively responded to it. And instead of saying, Tracy, that is terrible and very self-indulgent, you said, yes, fantastic. So um, thank you for that, because I really actually enjoyed writing that. Um, but then put in five extra stories, a um, little print at the back of Wild Goose Lodge. And um, it was, it was it was a print that I showed at an exhibition, so there was a little note beside it. Oh, my favourite thing, I nearly forgot, the story notes, because I love story notes, you see. Um, I love that, that idea of um, just hearing a little more about the background, which I guess is what we're doing now. But um, that was it. That was a real pleasure to write those. Um, yeah, so um, like each version of the Heimlich Manoeuvre is different, but kind of the same. There's one, there's one little change that um, I just want to bring up for you to kind of talk about, which, which you haven't, and I'm always interested in it. Uh, there is a story called A Lovely Place to Live. And the ending of that in the original Boo books and the ending of it in the uh, the Sinister Horror Company re-release is different. Oh, wow, I'd totally forgotten that. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Because um, I'd originally written that story. Mm, I'm trying to think. Um, I think I submitted it to an American publication and just wrote back said, God, that ending, no, it's too OTT. So I had substituted a much meeker ending for it. But when I talked to you about it, when we're bringing it out again, I I said, oh yeah, yeah, originally had a different ending for that. Originally a different ending as well for coming back, by the way, which I don't think I I shared with you. Again, I was just told, no, that's that's too dark. So I, I turned it into something hopeful. And I think that was the right decision. But I've always felt a bit dissatisfied with A Lovely Place to Live in its original incarnation, um, where the the protagonist just finds the, the ring belonging to one of the louts and she realises that they, you know, disappeared mysteriously. But in the, 20, in the 2018 version, I just went for broke and restored the original ending, which ends with a a memorable barbecue in the suburban housing estate. Um, Yeah, yeah, I went for the growth side. And you know, a lot of people have responded very positively to that um, because a lot of people find the comedy in that. It is um, kind of, I suppose, darkly funny. but in that story, I was really interested because, again, it's this idea of property crash in Ireland in 2008 when people were terrified that the equity was, was kind of dropping out of their houses. And I wanted to tap into that fear. And again, as I said, some of these stories start with a what if. And with that, with that story, I was like, how far would you go to protect the value of your house and your neighbourhood? Um, I've always been fascinated by Neighbourhood Watch and kind of organisations like that and their very trenchant attitude to what's permissible and what's not permissible within a certain area. Thanks for reminding me about that. I'd forgotten. So uh, I'm here to keep you on the straight and narrow. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> 
so 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 that's stuff that you um that, that, that we changed in the book we, you changed in the in the different versions as you kind of went through so uh, on the kind of flip side of that is there anything um in the book any details in the collection that you think are, are overlooked often by people um no i guess um i've talked about the ordering of the stories which is very significant to me but not to anybody else <laughs> um i don't know justin really i mean i think it's a it's a collection that everybody responds to very differently um one thing i was really surprised at when when it first came out and it's this has been a consistent one people respond very viscerally to the woman next door um and the idea within it of this of this woman who's obsessed with the woman next door who's leading the perfect life while well, the protagonist's postpartum depression the woman next door is just sailing through life and um this this borderline obsession she has with her builds up to a kind of, kind of a climactic set piece at the at the end where um her her baby has been entrusted to the woman next door disappears and it's all so many people have contacted me about that story to say what happened or what happens next which my answer is i don't know the story just ends there <laughs> but but i think a lot of mothers reacted really strongly to that story and fathers actually and um they and a few people said oh my god you really know how it feels and i thought oh that's kind of you to say so and then i thought oh i've never had a child you know i've never experienced that but it didn't matter because I was stepping through the story, because I was thinking from that perspective, because I um, tapped into kind of older conversations that I'd had with friends around kind of birth and the, the kind of feelings and the emotional fluxes that they'd experienced around it. Yeah, I was just really trying to walk through all of that. So I was glad that it succeeded, but I was quite surprised. I thought that was a very kind of um uh kind of downbeat little story almost until the ending but it's it's i'd say perhaps the most popular story in it uh, okay I, i've got one one last question for you around this and uh talking about popular stories uh, i'm going to put you on the spot now um so uh you're not allowed to choose remembering wild goose lodge because we think that one obviously is you expressed the importance of that one already so discounting that story of all the others which one is your favorite uh i look like you i speak like you i walk like you why would you say that i've always had a soft spot for it um because i really felt for the protagonist i i really I, I felt her terrible gnawing anxiety, her domestic imprisonment, and I sympathised with her. I sympathised her with her past the point I should have sympathised with her. Um, when it be, when it becomes, you know, like at the point where there's no way back for her, where she's complicit in the dreadful murder of her of her own twin where she's really kind of engineered the whole situation and set it up. And yet I still sympathized with her. And I, I could see the way that life turned her into a monster, a monster that she didn't necessarily want to be. And I think that my empathy for that character kind of leaked through. And I think that's why it was a hard sell in, in a lot of places, because um, I think a lot of editors were genuinely quite disturbed by this notion that this was a sympathetic monster. But I'm very interested in the trope of the dislikable uh, woman because I think sometimes uh, we're very socially engineered as women to be nice. We're socially engineered to take up less space, to be quieter, um, to, you know, um, be passive rather than active. 
And what I admired about that protagonist was even though she was a monster, even though she goes to horrible lengths, she is strong. She's, she's got this core of steel underneath her. And she's probably the most interesting character, I think. But having said that, Justin, you absolutely cheated because I would have said Wild Goose Lodge otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> because honestly, because that story is so knitted up with memories of my grandmother. Every single time I read that story, I cry. I can't. I'm actually with tears in my eyes talking about it right now. And there are very few of my stories that actually make me cry. Well, Tracy, thank you ever so much for taking the time to take a trip down memory lane and, and re-look at the Unheimlich manoeuvre um, and discuss it in such uh, frank detail with me. Uh, thank you very much. God, it was such a pleasure. Um, it's, it, it's an uncanny vista that I love to revisit and like nature of the uncanny itself, every time I go back and think about it and speak about it and um, we read it, I, I will find something different because I guess that's nature of the past and the way that it shifts within our present. So thank you so much for this opportunity. The Unheimlich Manoeuvre by Tracy Fahey is available on paperback and Kindle. The Kindle can be purchased from Amazon. The paperback can be found through most book retailers, including Waterstones, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and directly via the Sinister Horror Company at the website sinisterhorrorcompany.com. Thank you for listening. Being an independent publisher, we are just like you. We share the same passion, the same love for horror fiction. We believe in the incredible work being created unnoticed by the mainstream. And we want to share it with the world. We are the Sinister Horror Company.